So we are actually in the uh, Appalachian Mountains, uh, just outside of Brown Mountain this morning. If you watched our uh, Facebook little live series as we went on to Facebook Watch with UNESCO TV, um, we talked about how we were going to start filming some of our <laughs> filming adventures going to different farms so that people could see what we're actually doing when they donate to uh, Meet My Neighbor Productions. And, uh, because I know that those productions can take a long time from start to finish to actually get them out, which is why we've had uh, so few in the past. But thanks to the donations of you guys, we've been able to actually get out to farms that are further out than where we had gone before. And um, we're starting to cover more of them. So over this, this next year, we'll start rolling out more and more of these videos to help uh, promote some of these small farmers. Anyway, we have, um, when we film, we have to usually stay somewhat close to a farm. And um, Shauna's job is to find the, the most affordable spot she can um, within a filming location. We're actually gonna be filming two farms this weekend, or start filming two farms. And uh, she found this place about an hour from each of the places that we have to film, which is, which is fantastic. So um, this is a, <laughs> I don't know what you would call it. It's kind of like a glamping ground. They have small little cabins, very rustic cabins. And um, they also have yurts. I'd love to stay in a yurt, but I don't think it was in our budget. They have kind of communal areas where people can congregate. Um, and it's up here in the mountains, just at the base of Wilson's Creek Gorge, which is one of the largest wilderness areas um, it, it's the largest wilderness area in North Carolina, but it's definitely one of the largest wilderness areas in this part of the country. So there's a lot of great stuff out here. I'm actually going to get our sun up first. We don't have to be at our first location until 10, about 10.30 ish. So it's an hour there. So we have until about 9.30 here. And what I thought we'd do is uh, go for a little fly fishing adventure that got, um, Wilson's Creek right behind me, which is one of the best, in my opinion, best best creeks to fly fish in in North Carolina. So I'm going to go get him up and uh, we'll just take you guys along for the journey this weekend. And I'm sure we'll have some interesting comments from some of these farmers about um, how things are going in the current economy. Ben? 
Can you hold Daddy's pole? And I am going to... Are your hands cold? Yeah. It's pretty chilly this morning. Yeah, I'm gonna put a hook on this for you because I didn't get that done yet. Okay, yeah, so. You have some string out like this. And if you want more string, but be careful because there's a building right there. So. January so there's not much when it comes to fishing in January the trout kind of go into a, a uh, hibernation state of hibernation in a way they become very lethargic don't do a whole lot saying that it doesn't exist anymore. A vow renewal is like celebrating your wedding all over again. This would be the perfect place. What do you think? Yeah. Should we have a big party here? Yeah. Yeah, and invite all of our family and friends? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Well, they made it this stuff around this. But they made it from yeah. stuff here, because this is just driftwood. It's pretty cool. All right, let's go, guys. Let's go play outside again. Come on. I wish I would have known about it sooner. It's really, really cool. The uh, old pictures on the wall and the stonework, I mean, clearly it's been around for a long time and we just didn't know about it. But it's quite pleasant, rustic charm. 
and it's a camping resort. So it's good. It's glamping at its finest. Figure out which Pro Gear boot socks or Trekker boot socks. Are those the um, Buffalo Wool Company? Yes. I would for, go for filming this morning outside, and then we'll ch I'll change you to hiking boots later. But which ones? I'd maybe go with the Pro ones because the Trekkers might be a little Mommy. hot today. Okay. Can we go outside? I know I'm almost ready to go outside. I just have to get I want to go some outside. I'm socks saying. on. You're what? I'm saying that I want to go and I'm going to wait. I'm said that I wait till outside. Is that your cushy. first time trying? They are. It is. They're very, they've got a cushy butt bottom. Yeah. And like, it kind of reminds me of soccer socks, but not. They're, they have strategy to these socks. You can tell someone specifically designed them. Let's see how they do. Yesterday we went up to uh, the Secret Garden of Survival. We get to go see Mr. Rick Austin and Survivor Jane. Authors, hosts, there's deer. I missed it. Went from 800 something feet to now like 1100. This is good because we have the animal noises, but not the crickets. But or not the crickets. Cicadas. cicadas. Those were Next cicadas. Next year we'll up here and ask us if we would stop the bullfrog. It's like... What they write about in their books are things that are, um, are great for every farmer to learn because you're you're talking they're talking about permaculture, a real permaculture, nature culture, how things grow together, their symbiotic relationships and um, they have a food forest up there. It's really a beautiful place. But we may actually hold off on their video so we can get some spring footage. We have some fall footage. Um, we got our interviews done this weekend, uh, but we may need to come back and just get some spring footage so you can really see how this uh, garden looks and, and what's what's going on out there in, in the mountains. So it's a really cool place. Now I had been um, doing agricultural stuff sort of as a gentleman farmer for almost my entire adult life. And uh, I started off in New Hampshire uh, where I had apple orchards and um, you know did everything the traditional way, the way that you're told to do. And you know I sprayed pesticide uh, every 10 days and after every rain in my apple orchard. My trees were all growing in straight lines this way and straight lines that way. Uh, the branches were all touching each other. It was grass growing in between. Uh, I used fertilizer and weed killer and um, I still had scabby wormy apples just like every other apple farmer. I started looking at what native peoples throughout the world had done and what indigenous peoples were still doing today and found out that um, these people did not plant trees, did not plant fruits, did not plant vegetables. They didn't water, they didn't weed, they didn't fertilize, and they did just fine. Um, and I said, you know, that's the kind of way that we ought to be growing things. This is the way nature has been growing things for millions of years, without man's help, without chemicals. Uh, if you look at what happens in nature, um, typically you'll have a fruit tree or a nut tree, and that will grow up and eventually it will grow up higher and it will spread out. Now you have a canopy underneath that, a canopy of shade. And there are certain types of plants that enjoy that shade and there's a symbiotic relationship between the plants in the shade and the fruit tree or nut tree. So I looked more and more into ways to be able to grow food that way. We've got um, 
40 or 50 different fruit trees, so 40 or 50 different little guilds in our little secret garden of survival. And uh, it's less than quarter of an acre, and as time has gone on, these trees have gotten taller and taller and taller, and the bushes get taller and taller and bigger. They produce more and more fruit every single year. Uh, this year I had a peach tree that produced a thousand peaches and uh, so everybody here, all of our livestock, um, all of our, um, all of, well, the people here as well are all living off the, the land um, and uh, it's, it's been an amazing process. hours last night to just kind of hang out here and man this is a cool place um, they've got uh, llamas just kind of walking around it's like we we inadvertently came into a a third small farm are we in your space <laughs> easy Homestead. They have dairy cows here. They actually have ducks that were swimming around in here yesterday. So uh, they have a lot going on. It's just a cool place. And we just spent a, a little bit of time exploring, had a fire, roasted some marshmallows. So if you had a pocket knife and you need to get smaller pieces of wood, but you don't have a hatchet, take your knife and you just kind of set it on the wood. This is a very uneven table. And you take a piece of wood and you small slivers of wood that we need to start a fire. Pretty cool, huh? Mm-hmm. You ever seen somebody do that, that before? No. Mm -hmm. I tried to do it too thick that time. Let's see what we have here. We probably have enough to get things started. Where are you? Right behind you. Behind me where? It's 
starting to cook up there, Abby? Oh, man, it's just... Oh, oh that's the one. That one's mine. That just went there. One my voice is mine. Then you like them slightly like burned? It's pink. I want them to be on fire. Just let it slowly catch on fire. And that's how I like mine. All toasty and wrinkly. Super nice. And yours was the boy goat. That did what again? I, I was about to ask if I could see the bunnies, but I... I'm guessing that they said that they were gonna see me. Yeah, last time we were there, they... <laughs> Is that what the boats did? Did? Let me hear yours. <laughs> oh, it's like this. Those are some silly boats, huh? Mm -hmm. What about you, Daddy? What was your favorite animal that you've seen? so far. Today. Today? Mm -hmm. Today? The llama. Oh, the llama. Oh, I forgot about the llama. <laughs> yeah. The llama was a little intimidating. It was like this. Like, it was like... Well, it kept following us, and it was like getting really close to... I'm surprised it didn't spit at winter, though. I'm surprised winter didn't get upset. But, interesting. <laughs> it let me pet it. That's impressive because the guy that we spoke to earlier said that it spit on his leg. So. <laughs> we hoped we saw it this afternoon, huh? But no, no such luck. I think they put them away for the evening. <laughs> All right, Mr. Bull. This afternoon, we're heading down to Raising Roots Farm, where we're going to be filming a farmer who is kind of taken into this whole, you know, taking this whole food processing issue, meat processing, into his own hands. And so we're going to get to see what he's doing down there. Do you have a course of act? Like, do you have a plan? Yeah. What's yeah. your plan? Uh, we've had a lot of plans. <laughs> right. And I'll tell you how many of them worked out okay. exactly as we've wanted them. <laughs> Zero. None of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sort of our play here is um, kind of a relevant heritage breed herd. Because we're in, you know, if you're reading like Aww. Joe Salad into the letter, he'd say, never do this. This is stupid. Um, just get a pig and sell a pig. And that makes a lot of sense but we're in one of the top five pork producing uh, states in the yeah. country. Yeah. And furthermore, um, just a pig is kind of what you can get in the grocery store. It's, it's unimpressive, it doesn't taste very good. We chose the old spots because um, a lot of the genetics matter to taste and performance on pasture. People like this, the way we're raising them is working. It's, it's just exceptional quality. We have a process, we have a plan, it's working but we're not in control of any of it. Yeah. So like this, we either scale this on our own by opening a shop and, and getting control, or we just don't do it. It's yeah. hobby and homestead, and that's what, that's what it is. So, yeah. so we chose to, to embark on this, and then the COVID plan to sort of survive, um, you know, it just so happens that fortunately we had this in the works, otherwise we would, we would have already taken probably half this herd, if not way more to the sale barn, because yeah. we would have no options, there would be no out. Yeah. Uh, we haven't processed animals since August, yeah. uh, which is why we're we're way way overstocked right now. That's that's kind of um, 
you know, our plans plus our COVID survival plan kind of just became one because it's the cut and pack that's behind, not the kill. They have plenty of capacity for killing an animal. They don't have capacity for hanging it, processing it, getting it to a final retail cut. That's what's way, way far out in advance in terms of capacity. Because you've got the butcher shop, you're not going to dispatch here. Mm -hmm. You're going to take it to the dispatch facility, have them dispatched, and like you said, they have to be tagged and bagged properly yep. Yep. to come back here, and then you will process. Yep. And again, Raising Roots Farm is a farm that we're going to be filming between now and June. So it takes a lot of, you know, traveling and coming out and, and getting takes to get all the footage that we need for some of these videos. And so that's what we've been working on. Um, something that I had been asking the farmers, even, you know, last weekend when we filmed a hog culling out at Bryles Farm, is we've been asking them just kind of their take on what's, you know, what's happening in the marketplace right now, whether or not, you know, small farmers have a viable future with, with the way things have been going and what needs to be to be done. They are under threat right now, and I think that the only thing that we can do to really help reverse the situation is help educate people and, and wake them up to, you know, the realities of what's going on. Did the, um, the CARES Act had some stuff in there for meat processors. Was any of that helpful to getting something like this going? Yeah, yeah. Well, no. Yes and no. We, uh, we were going to apply. Um, the CARES Act had some in there, but prior to that, North Carolina even put about, I don't know, I think it started at like a $20 million bill, but I think it ended somewhere around like maybe 11 or something like that, 11 or 15. And they, in, they injected about, let's just call it 11 million bucks into the North Carolina meat processing group. Um, or all of the meat processors to try to expand capacity. And they were really targeting just existing. And we sort of fell in this weird gray area where we existed on paper because we already had our plant number filed with the state, but we weren't open and, and actively processing. Right. So they're like, ah, no, that's not really, you know, you're not really existing. You're not, you're not open, you're not operating. And, and so we didn't, we didn't end up qualifying for any of that cash. Now, if we were already open and we wanted to expand, there was a fair amount of cash available. And I think on the result of all of that investment, they're expecting the overall capacity in the state of North Carolina to almost double in terms of what the processing plants can handle. And I think that they held their feet to the fire to like February or March when a lot of those projects had to be in production. So for the most part, we should see kind of some of those processing woes ease up maybe uh, early this year. And a lot of those processing plants ought to be able to start taking on extra customers or extra capacity. The, the past year, you, you have some background in agriculture. You've seen some of these uh, farms and, uh, you know, even the, the small farmers with the livestock industry kind of get hammered with this whole event. Where do you kind of see small ag going in the future with the way things have been going? You think they're in trouble? <laughs> Define small ag, what do you mean? Yeah, I, I think traditional farmers are in trouble. I think traditional farmers are in trouble because they're reliant on the the ag system, uh, you know, using fertilizers and chemicals and weed killer and doing monocrop stuff, which is just by its very nature not natural. Um, so when you're doing monocrop stuff, it's it you're always fighting against nature, against the elements, against bugs, and it's a never-ending struggle for people. This but we have here, you plant once and harvest for a lifetime. I, mean, I don't worry about it, I don't think about it. I, you know, I just go out there and try to keep up with the production as it's coming out. Um, we don't have to have chemicals, fertilizer, weed killer, pesticides here. Nature just takes care of all of that. Um, I think there's a lot of political motivation. I think there's a lot of corporate motivation to destroy small farmers and destroy small farming. Um, you know, it. they want to consolidate, they want to, and you know, there's a lot of scuttlebutt about them trying to get rid of the meat supply. Well, look at who who's making fake meats out there. Um, they don't want the competition, they just as soon get rid of it. 